So good afternoon, everyone. I hope you enjoyed lunch. Don't fall asleep during this session. The famous after lunch dip, so not sure if you fall asleep. Um, so welcome. Um, my name is, uh, according to my Twitter handle, it's Martin Dynam. Um, according to that, I'm a father, I'm a husband. Um, I'm also a scuba diving instructor, so if you want to learn scuba diving, talk to me. If you want to be a lifeguard, talk to me, because I'm also a lifeguard and a lifeguard instructor. And uh, I'm an open source enthusiast, so I contribute to the Spring Framework and some other of the Spring Portfolio projects. I work for a small consulting firm in the Netherlands. I have about 40 colleagues. And I mainly do Java software development and Java consulting based projects. And I do write code. Um, this is actually one of my last commits with Spring Batch. So I do write code on a daily basis, mainly. Um, I also think about architecture and how we can solve issues. Um, small disclaimer, and Andy already told something about it in his keynote, and I think most of the speakers do. There are no silver bullets, so what I'm going to present here is just a solution to a problem. So it's not the solution to a problem, but because every solution and every architecture has a, uh, has a trade-off, and it's basically balancing trade-offs. So there is no silver bullet, golden hammer, or how you call it. So let's start with a show of hands. Who of you is using Spring Boot? Ooh, that's nearly everyone. Spring Cloud? Uh, less. Who is doing microservices? Who is really doing microservices, not just because they're using Spring Boot? <laughs> and who has heard of domain-driven design? Who is actually applying it to his daily job? <laughs> I have to raise my hand also. Uh, well, not really, a little. Uh, who knows JavaScript and is very good at JavaScript? And, <laughs> and likes JavaScript? Oh. Well, so we're going to do some hardcore JavaScript development. No, we're not. And I think there are three lines of JavaScript in the whole presentation, so stay with me. The rest is, well, HTML and, and Java. Um, anyone doing Angular? Angular or AngularJS? Enjoying it? Oh, well, still two or three hands up. So. We do Angular, we have one large application. And that's what actually led to this presentation. So that's actually the cause of this presentation. So let's start with microservices. Um, Sam Newman wrote a book on building uh, microservices. And he says microservices have certain characteristics. And one of them is that they are modeled around a business domain. So microservices does one thing, and it does it really good. It goes data in, and it goes stuff out, and they're loosely coupled. And when you have microservices, you probably have a lot of them. So you want to pursue a culture of automation. You want to be, be able to deploy with a click of a button. So you want to push a button somewhere, and off it goes to production. And according to Josh Long, that's the happiest place you can be. So um, a microservice also has to hide implementation details. So you only talk to the API, which generally is a REST API with JSON or XML or some other, pro some other uh, uh, content type. And you don't know if it uses a SQL data store or it uses a MongoDB. Depends on how interested in how you are in the integrity of your data. So it depends on what you use for your persistence. So you mainly talk to the API and it hides your, the way you implement into your microservice. You should decentralize, decentralize all the things. So you should do service discovery. There should be no direct communication. And there should be service discovery, a gateway. And you have to have a lot of services. And they should communicate on, in some way. They should be deployable independently. So if you do a modification on some service, you should be able to deploy it without deploying all the other 150 microservices you have. 
And if one fails, it should fail in isolation because when you use a microservices architecture, it should thrive. It should, failure is uh, not an exception, it's the rule when you use microservices. That's basically built into the architecture and how you uh, achieve all the uh, components with the service discovery and all the faint clients we can use with Spring Cloud with the uh, circuit breakers and stuff. And it should be highly observable. Um, if you use Spring Boot, you probably also use the actuator with all the metrics and the health monitoring and all the stuff you have. And maybe you collect them into one big data center or one big place so you can monitor your whole, uh, all, all, the whole lot of your microservices. So with that in mind, let's take a look at how a typical deployment would look. You probably would have a couple of services. There's an API gateway in front and you have to, then you have a UI and there's probably someone using the UI. So we typically end up with something like this. Um, it's a trimmed down version because there's probably some service discovery and it's probably deployed in different Amazon zones and availability zones and there's failover and scaling, but for now it works. So this is what we generally end up with. We have a couple of microservices. We're going to use the shop again. So it's a basic sample we use. And if we want to create an update or we, moni we modify things, um, we modify something in the customer service and there's another something in the order servers service. And we also have an invoice service. And generally when you change something in one of those services, there is also a change to the UI. And the problem here is there's only one UI because, well, we have a shop UI. So we are basically independently deployable in the back end, but we have an issue in the front end because there's just one big gap of JavaScript. In the beginning, I asked who is doing Angular, and we are doing Angular, and in the end, we have one large, basically one large JavaScript file. Even if we have a modularized uh, during development, in the end, it's one large JavaScript file which gets downloaded. So you have one large shop front end. So if you start deploying it, if you want to deploy the customer service, you have to deploy the shop UI, but there are still changes in one of the other services which also needs to change something in the shop UI. And well, you can see the problem here. They all depend on, hey, there was a green bar, ah, there it is, on the shop UI. So they all have a, a single dependency and basically a single point of failure here on the shop UI. And you can only deploy the backend if you also deploy the UI. So if you don't, you can deliver the value to the customers of your shop. And also when you have one single UI, you probably have to put it in a single code base. So you have a lot of int integration points with the different teams maintaining the different microservices. And well, what is that? Because you have a single UI, you basically lose the benefit of the fact that you can deploy it independently because you are now somewhat bound to all the other services through the front end. And initially I said a microservice is modeled around a business domain, but basically when you look at the front end, it's not really a microservice. It's just one big monolithic front end again, which is not really modeled around a single business domain, but it incorporates a couple of business domains. So that, that is a bit problematic in the case of a microservice architecture at least in our experience. So we figured there has to be a better way. And after a lot of Googling and searching on the internet, I came across self-contained systems. Anyone heard of them? I see a couple of hands. Ah, Dave, of course. Welcome. Um, there are a lot of presentations from Stefan Tilkov about self-contained systems. And if you look at them, they generally apply to, are described as autonomous web applications. So you take the customer service and you deploy it independently. Just basically, it, it has a lot of characteristics, uh, the same characteristics as a microservice, as it's in the, uh, independently deployable. So it's autonomous a web application. It is owned by one team. <coughs> Sorry. So. The logic and everything else, including the UI, is owned by a single team. Um, communication between different self-contained systems is asynchronous. 
when possible, so it's preferred. So you can use uh, a queue or messaging or event-driven architecture to communicate between different self-contained systems. Uh, you want to avoid tight coupling, so you don't want to share business code. It's basically the same as with microservices. You want to limit uh, the amount of code you share between different services. And it includes data and logic, as well as UI. So it includes the database, it includes all the logic, the business logic, and it's often a bit more coarse-grained than a microservice. It does a little more than a single microservice does. And the service API is optional. So you don't have to have a REST API when you use a self-contained system. Because it has, it has a UI. So if you look at a deployment of a self-contained system, it could look something like this. So we have our customer service, our invoice service, and our order service, and there's still a, probably a reverse proxy in front of that, which does the dispatching. And it solves also a lot of issues with cross-domain policies and trying to execute JavaScript for different services. And integration for a self-contained system is preferably done on the UI level. So you want to integrate on the UI level and not on a, uh, a logic level, if you can. So when you want to integrate on the UI level, how could you create a coupling between two different applications? Well, you could, in the most basic form, use links. So you could use href to a different service. Or you could, you could use JavaScript to use a HTML request and then pull the HTML and just display it in a div. I would say iframe, but it's frowned upon. Um, if you use Nginx or Apache, you could use server-side includes. They're old, but they're still working. So, And if you use a cache, uh, there are some cache implementations that support also a server, something like an include. So there's an edge-side edge include that you can use. So those are ways you can integrate the UI. Um, if you have, must integrate at the logic level, so you want to communicate between different services, you can do that preferably asynchronous. So you want to send messages or events. Uh, on an event bus, you can use uh, ActiveMQ or you can use Kafka or anything. You can just to send events between different self-contained systems. And if you <coughs> must do a synchronous call, you can use REST. So I said the service API is optional. Um, you still can use it. You can still create a REST API. So you can just call a, a different service from one and another. Um, so, or an RPC, if, you, if you're on a Java level, you could use RPC, RMI, or any other means of uh, remoting that's preferably Spring supports. So there's some remoting support there. Um, so how would that look? I have created a small demo, and hopefully toggling between different, this works. So I actually have three services. Can you read it in the back? Or? Okay. That's an advantage of having a low resolution, I think. So, so. Um, I have two services, a customer service serving our customer information, and I also have an order service, which is serving our order information, so what people ordered, and we can uh, show it to different users. And I have a gateway, which is basically just a Zool proxy, acting as a reverse proxy. Um, I could also have used Nginx or Apache HTTPD to do the reverse proxying, but I used Zool. I already st started them, so there's the gateway, the customer service, and here's my order service. I also put some data in there so we can show something. So, so if we go to the home page, <coughs> this is it. Doesn't look really exciting. It's just an old regular shop. I haven't created something to log in, but I can browse customers. And there's me. 
Apparently, Sergey also bought stuff on this shop. Not sure what, but. And there's a bunch of orders. So let's see what's in here. So we can browse. So apparently, I bought Spring recipes and clean code. Probably, I need to work on that. So I think my code needs to be organized, I think. So I'm not sure. So we can also click on a customer, so I can, can click on myself. And there's a link over here, order by customer, orders by customer. And I can click on the link and just go back, then I go to the order system and uh, sh now I'm shown my orders, so these are my orders. And on the back end, it's just a regular Spring application. So let's take a look at the order service, which just has a regular controller with some parameters. It's nothing fancy. Actually, but this is, it's returning a few, so it's not returning a JSON representation of my order. It's just a, just a page. I'm using time leaf over here, so. So this is the, the time leaf template, which shows the orders. And the same is basically done for customers. So they both have their UI, they're based on time leaf, so they do server side rendering. And what I didn't tell you is that I had JavaScript disabled in this case. So now I have a regular link. And if I enable JavaScript, I still have the same application. And now I see me orders on my customer page. So I integrate it on the UI level. And now we're going to get into the JavaScript I was talking about. It three lines of JavaScript. I'm actually using jQuery. To replace part of my HTML, I have, have a special class on my link. And I've, if I have JavaScript enabled, I basically go fetch the data from that link and then put it in a diff. Um, for this sample, that was enough. So I'm going to load the, the stuff and just put it in there. Um, you can already see basically the problem with this. So there's, there's trade-offs doing this with uh, self-contained systems. The advantage is I can now modify my order project. And I have my order number, order date, there's items, and I have the amount. Um, I know the order also has a uh, receive date. so. Let's try edit to our order. Um, I'm using Spring Data and I'm using projections, although this morning I heard from uh, Mr. Simons I shouldn't be using them, but I should be using Juke <coughs> instead. So, but still, I'm going with projections. So I'm going to add the delivery date. And I'm going to oh, modify my orders to my template to include the HTML. And DevTools does what it should do. It should have restarted my application. And if I refresh my customer page, I have the new order stuff without redeploying my customer service. And I still have a working UI. Of course, this is a very simplified example, but it, it works uh, quite nicely. You can do more nifty things with the JavaScript, and you probably um, want to do that. Uh, let's switch back. Hopefully, my keynote doesn't crash because. So we're coupling on the API level using either links. So if someone has JavaScript enabled, you can press a link. Or if you have JavaScript enabled, you can just enrich your page with certain parts of the UI. 
<coughs> but as I already mentioned in the beginning, um, every choice, choice you make has a trade-off. So you can use microservices or you can use a self-contained system or you can build a monolith for the sake, for the sake of it. But every choice you make has trade-offs and has certain challenges. And when you use a self-contained system, um, these are a, a number of the challenges you might face. Um, because there are separate systems, um, it can be hard to get a consistency in styling over the different applications, especially if you use menus and uh, different styles. And so it, it can be quite hard. So you probably need a very good style guide and communication between teams to get that stuff right. Um, you could put all the style sheets, all the shared stuff on an asset server. So you can fetch them from a single point. So you can use that in every self-contained system you have. Um, I use JavaScript. I use jQuery to load and fetch data from a different server, uh, from, from another URL and put it as HTML directly in our, um, in our page. Um, it can be a challenge to work with different versions of the JavaScript libraries. So if, if my order service would have an older version of jQuery and I have a newer one, you probably run into issues or the other way around. So you might get all those challenges of getting the versioning of the JavaScript libraries right. Or maybe it doesn't even use jQuery, so it can be a challenge. So again, at least you need a lot of communication between the different teams to, to get those things right. Also, you can put them uh, on a different asset server. Um, I used the reverse proxy here as an asset server, so all the JavaScript and all the style sheets I used were on a single server, so I use it as a, basically as a web server as well. So in that, in that regard, I cheated a little with the demo. Um, when executing JavaScript, there are, well, uh, in, in doing requests to different URLs. Um, there can be different, there can be security issues at hand, especially with cross-site requests and um, executing JavaScript on a different <coughs> domain. So it can, be, it can be challenging to get right. Um, putting a proxy in front helps because then you have a single URL or at least a single domain execute on, so that, that already helps. Um, and also from a development point of view, um, I'm a Java developer for 20 years, and I'm really good at Java, but my JavaScript skills are eh, not so good. So that's, that's why I asked in the beginning who is doing JavaScript and likes it and is very good at it, because you really need to, be, to have some JavaScript skills and front-end skills. To, co to combine this in a team. So you have to be well first in both, both worlds to make this work. So as I said, my JavaScript skills aren't that good, so that's why I only wrote those three lines. So, so it requires a lot of um, skill on, on your part. And I'm talk talking way too fast, so I'm already basically to the questions. <laughs> I didn't do a synchronous demo with sending events to the different server because I thought it would take too much time, but uh, you could also include a form in there and do uh, place an order, for instance. So, any questions? Oh, silence. Everyone is in the after dinner dip. Yeah. What about the common components that you like? Mm -hmm. Well, in the sample, I duplicated them. Um, I did play around with, um, yeah, I'm not sure how to call it, a UI gateway or an, as a, a different thing from the API gateway, and I used uh, um, tiles. So basically I used that and then it, it, it acted as a proxy and it also enriched my page. So, so we used that to, uh, in our proof of concept to uh, have styling. Um, I also did a proof of concept with uh, site mesh, which is a filter. So, which also worked, but um, it takes some performance. So that's that's a drawback because you have a filter which is basically proxying again, and then it, you get stuff back, and then it's enriched. So, and you have to include. <coughs> probably, you want to exclude some URLs from there. So, but there are ways uh, to solve it. So yeah. So we used. I, I did two proof of concepts: one with tiles and one with um, side mesh. Side mesh was easier to get working actually. Anyone knows side mesh? Oh, 
Or if you want to sing a song, you can also. Uh, because site mesh is really old. I think there's, th there's a version three now. I'm not sure what the state is currently, but there was a final somewhere. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, I showed the other one. Um, what I said, I cheated here. So I, I, I put a gen... Uh, so there's HTML, there's basically the header, and everything else is in there. Um, we had a div with a certain ID, which contained all the content. In this case, it's a container. So... I could have used tiles also on, on in here, so to include for every uh, self-contained service to have all the uh, shared components in a single uh, tiles definition and only have the content rendered. So you could be a bit smarter about it. Yeah, yeah. And you want to see the URL? Yeah, yeah. Uh, sources. Uh oh. So I actually used the WebJar's locator. So it's actually replacing uh, all my URLs to WebJar's. And I used the proxy as a asset server for all the assets. So. So they Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that's a bit of a drawback in this case. So because I use web jars, if I wouldn't, if I didn't use web jars, then you wouldn't have the the problem. Then you could just point it to your single shared resource. The drawback is then you have to have it running in development. So that's again, it's it's about trade-offs. So I use web jars because it's pretty easy to get a project running with it. You could also try and I, I had a bit of a struggle. I. I I tried to get it running with all the, everything self-contained, so also the JavaScript and the style sheets. And um, I, because I think I used Zool instead of uh, Nginx, I had a bit of an issue with URL rewriting for, for, the, uh, for the style sheets. So that's why I chose to uh, have it served as a, or <coughs> act as a asset server as well. So I think I, when, if you use Nginx or something, you could do URL rewriting better in your HTML, I'm not sure. It's, it's tricky to get right that way, so. But you can run it without the, uh, if you go to the individual URLs, they still look the same, so. Oops. Oh. This one. So this is the single service. Oh, interesting. And I get the URL. Ah, yeah. Ah, interesting. Because I click a link, it thinks it needs to serve JSON. That's an interesting one. Because I use a path. I need to fix that one. Because it should go to the order page. So that's an interesting one. I actually have a, I have a controller which is, um, I'm using Spring Data, Spring Data, and Spring Data REST to expose my REST endpoints because I wanted to have a service API. So, but when I now click a link, it's actually Spring Data uh, REST that is uh, accepting that URL instead of my own controller. So that's interesting. Any more questions? I'm gonna fix it for the. Client side rendering. Yeah, well, you can um, you can create a hybrid solution. Um, that's I think Facebook and Twitter do it now. They do s partially server side rendering, and then they push everything uh, to the client, and then updates and all the small stuff is done with um, uh, client side updates. Um, we didn't actually have that, so we basically had quite static pages, and because we had a large Angular uh, application, we want to split that in different uh, sections. 
Um, and it was quite static, so we didn't really have uh, instant updates from the back end or updates pushed to the front end that we needed to update all that stuff. So we were actually fine with server-side rendering, actually. But you could, you could create a hybrid <coughs> solution. No, we actually did a proof of concept. So we're still in the debate or if you should put the effort in or if you should keep it as we have now or move to Angular 4. Or, so that's, there's still a discussion going on. But um, what we're really fighting is the fact that we have a really modularized backend, but we're still bound by the large front end we have. So, and I really haven't found a better way in Angular to, well, you could create multiple single page apps, of course. Then you would also have a basically self-contained system with a single page app on, on front of that. So, so you could create smaller single page applications. How would you make that? Sorry? And how would you make that? Um, well, that would be a more challenge, I think. I'm not that good at Angular. Um, so I, but basically you can do a call and in the end it's still HTML, but it's a bit more dynamic, I think. So I'm not sure how that would work. There are some, uh, I know there are directives who can do transclusion. Um, Stefan Tilkoff is basically saying, well, if you have a link, you can follow it and you can put part of your HTML in your page. It's, that's what he calls transclusion. Um, and there's some directives in Angular you can use to do that kind of stuff. So there is some support for in Angular. At least Angular 1, I'm not sure if they ported it to Angular itself. So. I should try that. Interesting use case. So it's a very short one then. Um, so there's a whole website on self-contained systems architecture, as they call it. Um, there's also an interesting article by Eberhard Wolf on <coughs> InfoQ. Um, he called it uh, SC. Self-contained systems are microservices done right. Not sure if that's the case. It's, it's a choice you have and it's a trade-off. Everything has, um, every choice you make has a, has a trade-off, as I said, and there are no silver bullets. Um, there's an interesting uh, presentation. I think it's the uh, one from Stefan Tilkoff, and it's titled, Wait, What? Our Microservices Have Actual Users? So it's actually, it's a nice presentation to watch. And the demo is on my GitHub, so if you want to check it out, it's on GitHub. I'm gonna fix the issue that you click the link and then you get JSON instead of HTML, so I'm gonna fix it. It was one o'clock yesterday evening and then I, then I stopped with the demo. And it actually works when you go to the proxy, so that's an interesting one. And then we have a short presentation. So if you have no more questions, then you're, feel free to leave. Or I'm here for the next two days, so feel free to contact me. Anything spring related or...